if you're visiting here with us, we trust that you can enjoy this time with us this morning. And um, I don't know about you, we've been away over the holiday last, last two, no, last week I preached for the first time this year, and we shared on, um, if you can remember those of you who've been here in Mark 4, about the story about Jesus uh, calming the storm, that he's inviting his disciples. So we shared on that, uh, and you can listen to that online if you want to have a look at that. But um, just to recap on that for those of you that's not been here, because it does help us uh, to get some context of where we're going, because I did tell you last week that we're going to connect two stories and we're going to continue, because uh, what happened is Jesus was uh, sitting with his disciples. They had a normal church meeting, let's put it that way. And uh, at one point Jesus says, okay, that's the end of the church meeting. We're crossing uh, the lake or the sea. So you want to get with me into the boat? And he invited them. He didn't command them, he invited them. And as a result of that invitation that took place, there was three groups of people that, uh, there are three things that happened, or three groups of people that formed as a result of one invitation. And we said, you know, that uh, whenever Christ is in issuing an invitation that causes uh, a bit of disruption and that uh, forces us to group and decide where we're going to. And so what happened is some of them stayed behind. We don't know for what reason. Um, we can add to the f some flavor to that and say it was this and that and something that we can possibly relate to. Uh, not necessarily that it was right, because actually the, 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 the guys that were uh, with him, that were with him in the boat, because there were another group, there were three groups, the guys that stayed behind, the guys that were with him in the boat, and there were a couple of them that followed him from a distance. And the ones that were with him in the boat were right in the middle of the storm. And they're the ones that be able to testify of what, uh, what they experienced. So... Uh, that just uh, brought me to that conclusion that I saw is that in the kingdom we'll have three, three different kinds of groups. Those that always hear about what happens, those that saw, and those that experience. You know, and I, I really trust that this year that will be your ambition and inspiration to make sure that you are there with the experience, experiencing what Christ wants you to experience, the fullness of that. You know, just hearing how that's this and this happened. So, um, but the story didn't stop there. There's more to that story and we're going to discover that. But before we go there, I've got a little or a little coil here. We all know probably what this is and what is happening when you pull this. Um, you can stretch this, but uh, it would go back to the normal position. Okay. Which is interesting because it reminds me of our, our spiritual journey. You know, it reminds me of myself. It reminds me of I want to say others. Then it looks like I'm preaching to others. I'm preaching for myself here this morning. Um, because whenever we are in God's presence, and wherever we are with Jesus, and that's what happened that day, that Jesus had to issue an invitation to take them to the other side. As a result of that invitation, some decided, no, we're not going to go with you. There was a moment of uh, stretching taking place. Do you want to get with me into the boat? Um, Jesus, maybe not today, next time, next Sunday. Uh, we really got some cooking to do, got the kids at home, you know, got homework, uh, what can we put in there? You can decide for yourself, anything. But, um, but it's like our journey with Christ as well, you know. We, um, Christ says, uh, let me just stretch you a little bit, because we live in this norm, in this box of Christianity, and this is the way it's supposed to be, and this is the way I grew up, and this is the way I pray, and this is the way I do things, and and then every now and then Christ would just get into that place of our little box and he says, uh, allow me to do that. And then when he starts doing that, it's, we, we go, oh, no, 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 Lord, 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 leave, leave. And then we go back to the normal position. Because I like my comfort. I like the known. I love the fact that I can predict things and that I'm in control of things. And when Christ pulls me, it's not comfortable. I don't, oh, Lord, leave, leave. Okay, and then we go back. to. And then you wonder why you're, relationship with Christ sometimes or Christianity seems to be sometimes boring. It's because of this one thing. We don't allow him, or we don't give him f full permission. But here's the thing. If you push this or pull this hard enough, there's a point if you pull behind, beyond that point, this thing will never go back to the normal position. And it's exactly the same in our relationship with God. If you allow God to take you to that place, you'll never be the same. Never, ever. You can never go back. And that's the thing. Once you've had that revelation, once you've had that experience, once you've been in that place, you cannot but not say, God, I, oh, I'm not the same anymore. There's something that needs to... And you know Christ wants to do that quite often in our lives, I think. Actual fact, it happened with the disciples that day. That while they were sitting there, and that's why it happened there, there was a crowd that formed around the tree, 
There was a crowd, another boat in the crowd with Jesus. As a result of this thing, or this illustration, that God wants to so often say, listen, let's get in the boat. And I said last week as well, he didn't offer them a lot of details. And that's what I find with Christ as well often, that he would, um, doesn't give us a lot of details when he invites us. Can you just come? Uh, look at the way he called his disciples. I've shared that many times, thousands of times. The way Christ, because he requires faith. He requires something more of us. He actually needs to bring us to the place that we are so comfortable and trust Christ so much that we can say yes to Christ without any detail given to us. You know what I don't sometimes, I don't know. <laughs> sometimes I would like to know a little bit more info. And it's not that Christ doesn't want to give it to us, but sometimes Christ deliberately does that because he's taking us on this journey. Likewise with his disciples, he's intending to take them on this journey that day specifically to stretch them because the next 24 hours would stretch them beyond that place that they would never be the same again. It wasn't just an ordinary journey that evening when he gave them invitation. 24 hours, the next 24 hours was so vital in their spiritual journey that would change them forever. The way they look at Christ, the things that they've seen, the, the, the places they've gone to, the way Christ reacted to the situation and all of that, what they learned out of that would change them forever. Amazing what 24 hours in the presence of God can do. This year when we have our men's camp, 9 to 11th of March, all the men, you must say amen and make a note of that, 9 to 11th of March, next, uh, March, next week we're going to launch that and give you more information about that. But this year we're going to have from Stephen Lungu again there. And it's just such an inspiration and blessing to us in such many ways. We've got other speakers there as well. But um, he stays me five or seven minutes, something like that, in God's presence, changing him forever. He was walking into that place intending to kill all the Christians. It's within a crusade. It happened back in Zimbabwe. And um, his plan was back then, he was still a terrorist. He was, uh, he was filled with rage and anger. And he wanted to kill the Christians. He walked into that place. Five minutes, he sat there, stand, stood there at the back, and the next thing, God touched him. Amazing what God can do in five minutes in your life. What God could do for 24 hours with the disciples. He's sitting here for an hour and a half maybe this morning. Have you been here long enough? I don't know, add that up. It's, many, it's much more than 24 hours. If we are truly in the presence of God. If I say truly, that means He's got our full attention. I came here prepared. I'm there all the time. Then I guess I should look quite a lot like Jesus after all those hours. Ain't we supposed to? So some, sometimes we are leaking, <laughs> in a way, if I can put it that way. And it's, uh, it's maybe good to, at the beginning of this year to find out where it's a leak. <laughs> and I don't think it's, a God's, it's God's side that his, uh, his power is diminished. Actual fact, listen to what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 11. Can we read to get it up there? And we're talking, by the way, on this, the subject of where is the love this morning. That's our theme for this year. And this morning we touch on love is to go. But before we go there, there's a scripture in 2 Corinthians 11 that Paul wrote to the church there, and he's worried and concerned about the church. He's writing this to believers, to us this morning. He says, but I fear, now he's, he's concerned that somehow your pure and undivided devotion to Christ will be corrupted, just as Eve was deceived by the cunning ways of the serpent. You happily put up with whatever anyone tells you, even if they preach a different Jesus than the one we preach, or a different kind of spirit than the one you received, or a different kind of gospel than the one you believed. Look at that word. Your pure and undivided devotion to Christ. Paul didn't say, you're not going to be devoted to Christ anymore. He didn't say, I'm worried that you're going to stop following Christ. I'm just more worried that your devotion to Christ will not be pure anymore. <coughs> if I correctly translate it, it's speaking to us. Church goers, relation, confessing that we have a relationship with God. And the reason why you sit here this morning is because you most probably have a form of devotion to God. The question I need to ask and you need to ask is, is my devotion pure and, undev or dev uh, pure and uh, undevoted? Pure and free from mixture. Look at that word. Free from mixture, unconnected from anything else, and disinterested. That means I'm not interested in that and that. Totally interested. In that. Next word, undivided, existing as a whole, not in separate parts. And I shared in the first service as well, if you've got a work box and you've got a house box, You've got a church box. You've got a friend's box. And uh, I, I just want to say to you, you've got a divided box. You haven't got 
you've got divided devotion. Because Christ wants to enter into your work box. And then he wants to say to you, let the kingdom come. No, God, right? Not, not now. God, we do that. If your relationship and my relationship consists of an hour and a half in the week doing what we're doing here, then it's pretty much boring. And actually, we're just playing religion. You know? But Christ says, I want to be in your family box as well. For me, there's no barriers. Because Christ is all and in all, says the scripture. So here's the thing. Paul is concerned about our devotion. And in the last days, he says, I'm not worried that people will stop following me. I'm just more worried that your conscience will be silent and that you will start serving another Jesus. Look at that scripture there. Another Jesus. It's possible to sit here this morning, I'm going to say it here, <coughs> slowly, that you serve another Jesus. The Jesus that you and I create for ourselves, that fits our little world. You don't understand that? Let me help you here. Sometimes, when I'm, you, know, you mingle with people and, and you see the challenges of life, you see the things they're addressing, how, how, the, how the light confront this, confronts darkness, and we in this process of being formed into the image of Christ. But every time when we justify and we say, you know what, God will understand my situation. My Jesus will understand. You just created yourself, your Jesus. Because whenever Jesus enters and confronts the truth, I'm supposed to change. But whenever I adapt Jesus, and you know, I'm just going to stay, stay like this because Jesus will understand. And then we even become more spiritual. We use the word season. I hate it sometimes when we use seasons when it's not seasons. You know, I'm the season to just do nothing. And God will understand. You just created yourself a Jesus that fits. You know, this is happening, but right now, Jesus will understand. And slowly we form this Jesus that Paul needs to say, I'm worried that you, will be, that you will put up with that. That that kind of spirit will be present in your life and your devotion becomes divided. And I'm sure this morning there's for all of us something to ponder upon about this devotion thing, about God, have, is my devotion purely and undivided? Is it, am I completely focused upon you? Or if I allow the, another Jesus or another spirit Coming, and this is what happened. God had to take them, Jesus had to take them into this journey to purify them, to change them, so that they could find out what is real love. And we're talking about that this morning. Love is to go. So let's read from Mark 5. We're going to continue, like I shared with you. It happened where Jesus calmed the storm. So now we're picking it up from Mark 5. Remember that in the Bible, oh, the original scripts, there weren't any chapters, so this is one story just unfolding. Okay, we have chapters, but. It wasn't there back then. So we had the story as um, Jesus invited him um, to journey with him. But well, let's first read and then we're going to unpack that story. Verse five, uh, chapter 5, verse 1. So they arrived at the other side of the lake in the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus climbed out of the boat, the man possessed by an evil spirit came off the boat. I uh, came, climbed out of the boat. Sorry, sorry. Remind, rewind, rewind, rewind. Lost my place for a moment. When Jesus climbed out of the boat, a man possessed by an evil spirit came out from a cemetery to meet him. Interesting place. This man lived among the burial caves and could no longer be restrained, even with chain. Whenever he was put into chains and shackles, as he was often was, he snapped the chains from his wrist and smashed the shackles. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Day and night he wandered among the burial caves and in the hills, howling and cutting himself with sharp stones. When Jesus was still some distance away, the man saw him, ran to meet him, and bowed low, low before him. With a shriek, he screamed, Why are you interfering with me, Jesus, son of the Most High God? In the name of God, I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus already said to the spirit, Come out of the man, you evil spirit. Then Jesus demanded, What is your name? And, they pro and he replied, My name is Legion, because there are many of us inside this man. Then the evil spirits begged him again and again not to send them to some distant place. There happened to be a large herd of pigs feeding on the hillside nearby. Send us into those pigs, the spirits begged. Let us enter them. So Jesus gave them permission. The evil spirits came out of the man and entered the pigs, and the entire herd of about 2,000 pigs plunged down the steep hillside into the lake and drowned into the water. The herdsmen fled to the nearby town and the surrounding countryside, spreading the news as they, as they ran. People rushed out to see what happened. A crowd soon gathered around Jesus and they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons. He was sitting there fully clothed and perfectly sane and they were all afraid. 
Then those who had seen what happened told the others about the demon-possessed man and the pigs. And the crowd began pleading with Jesus to go away and leave them alone. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. But Jesus said, No, go home to your family and tell them everything the Lord has done for you and how merciful he has been. Who said the Bible is boring? It's quite an interesting story. In the next 24 hours, like I said, for the disciples was such a an, such an vital experience. And this morning as we share in love and the real Jesus and real love, I first of all want to make a statement. But what happens is, before we make the statement, maybe just pick up on that and say, you know, if I look in Scripture, I see something about Jesus. I see Jesus in the marketplace. I see Jesus in the synagogue. I see Jesus in the temple. I see Jesus in the, at the river, Jordan River. I see Jesus on the mountain. I see Jesus in the business. Oh, I see Jesus praying. This is something about Jesus. He's like, like me this morning. Can't just stand still in one place. You've got to follow me all the time. And you've got to be with Jesus. You've got to follow him. Because Jesus didn't come after his uh, baptism when he was commissioned and said, okay, this is my ministry. Now we're going to go to church and back. Work, church, and back. No, no, not that order. It's all over and everywhere. Christ is all and in all and everywhere, I want to say. No compartments, because at any given time, Christ wants to, he's just continuing with the journey. And if we want to follow Christ and we want to search for real love, we need to be on that journey with Christ. You say to me this morning, I am on the journey. Well, I'll ask you, what happened lately on that journey? Some of us, we just take a walk with them. Church, home. Church, work. And that's our relationship. Maybe that's just a walk. But the real journey becomes exciting. Especially in this case, when we read the story about the disciples, what happened, what took place here. Because there's something about Jesus. Jesus is on a mission at all times. And right now, where we are, when we are privileged to have the Holy Spirit with us, Christ is still on a mission. Till we all either depart before He comes back or when He comes back, He's on a mission through the Holy Spirit. And if I and you, we are going to say, God, we're following you, you'll have to be on a mission. And people that are on a mission, people that are journeying with Christ, I'm making spirit, and I'm going to say it slowly so that I make sure I don't make any mistakes in this. If we declare this morning, or we confirm, or we, whatever you want to say, you agree with me this morning that you want to journey with Christ, that means I am making spiritful, spirit-led decisions based upon the kingdom of God. That means, if that is the direction that we're going, or Christ wants us to go, or this is where his mission is taking place, I get in line with that. God, my, my whole family, my whole being, my work, everything is around that. It's not about... You see, there's a difference between that. Uh, there's two types of Christians we get. Those that are on mission with Christ and those that invite Christ on their mission. Lord, can you come along? I'm on that way. I'm going that direction. Can you bless that and be with us and let your presence just be with us as well? It's a different thing when we're on Christ's mission. And I often share on that, but it's so important that you know, that we align our families and our work around that as well. Say, so God, it's not about what I really want. What do you want? Because there's a bigger purpose. You know, and life on earth is so short here. I don't know about you. If you get 80 years short, my friend, compared to eternity, you better get on that journey. You better respond to that invitation because Christ wants to take you to amazing places. That he took their disciples. He took them into that storm. Interesting that he would take them as evening came, the Bible said, and they took them into, into the storm at night. Hmm. Why would he take them at night? Let me propose to you what I think had happened. I don't know if you've ever been in a storm or when uh, we don't get a lot of that here in Swakop with the rain and stuff. You know, my children, often when we go out of here, they don't even recognize uh, seasons. So I have to tell them this is now autumn. Okay, this is why it looks like this. We have just one season here. <laughs> it always looks the same, isn't it? <laughs> anyway, but um, when you're in a storm during the day, it's okay because you can see outside. You can see, well, the water is a lot, you know. But when it's at night and you hear the thunder and you hear the water and you see all of that and you hear the water coming down. But what happens with the storm is when it's at night and it's raining 
and you don't know what's happening around you, it's, it's okay. We want the rain, but at a certain point you start worrying because uh, I don't know what's happening around me. Anytime we go into an unknown territory where we cannot see anymore, because we, here's the thing, God wanted to take them beyond the place where they can walk, not just by what they see, but by faith. And if we're going to follow Christ, we'll have to get to that place where we follow according to faith, not according to sight. That's difficult, eh? Our natural man wants to make decisions according to what we see and what we perceive is logical. And I'm not saying don't use your brain. I'm not saying put that aside. I'm just saying if we really want to walk in faith, you need to respond to the invitation of Christ that doesn't make sense. And most probably it will take you on a journey. Some stayed behind under that tree and others were within the boat and actually was at night. And then things happened. Actually very interesting. The storm came up and, and Jesus, bad timing, he's sleeping. Jesus often get bad timing when we're in the storm. Huh? I don't know about you. I always thought, Jesus, can't you? Where are you? You're so silent. We shared on that last week as well. But Jesus, I believe, did that deliberately, just allowing them for a moment just to panic a little bit, just to, just to get in touch with the emotion and all of that. And the boat, think about that. And the people think, oh, Jesus, just wake him up. Man. The boat's going to break. And the storm is just becoming worse and worse. And then somewhere... They got Jesus awake, and, uh, and Jesus says, storm be still. Boom. One word. One sentence. God can turn your whole life around with one sentence. Amazing if you allow him to do that. And the lesson was right there in the middle of the storm. We would love to pray the storm away. Jesus, take away the storm. No, no, I want you to see that I'm in control of that. I want you to be in touch with that fear and then confront that with faith. See, we want to get the lesson afterwards. The lesson is in the middle of the storm. Right now, there. Just have a moment there. Ask the Lord, Lord, are you trying to get my attention? Are you trying to say something here to me? But if we're going to journey with God, or we're going to search for love this morning, we'll have to follow Jesus because He's going to lead us on this journey to some interesting places. Like in this story. Guys on the boat. Now I just want you to see this. Get with me into the boat. Rewind a little bit back to Mark 5 in your head this morning to 2,000 years ago, roughly. They've been through the night. They've been through the storm. They had a rough night. Didn't sleep well. Uh, they saw Jesus' power, but before that there was a, quite a, a lot of things happening and they were afraid. Almost, we almost died last night, but thanks to Jesus we are here. Can we just get to the other side? Now, as they get to the other side, the Bible tell, tells us that there's a man that were running nakedly there and howling. Now, I don't want to sound like a wolf or a lion this morning. I'm not going to try and do that. But uh, maybe some of the children will run out this morning. Then I'm, a, then I'm actually good, good actor if I can manage to do that. But uh, anyway, what happens, they get to this, they row the, uh, the boat and they get to, so we row the boat, get to the other side. And then, uh, by the way, just Google that area, and then you see what it looks like there. It didn't look like Mauritius, okay? It didn't look like Zanzibar, and didn't look like any beautiful Cape Town beach that you have, beautiful beaches. I know some of us think, okay, Jesus, I'm with you on the journey. We're going to Mauritius, and then on the other side, we've got a waiter waiting for us with a, a drink, helping. Oh, what can we do for you here in the kingdom? Have you arrived? Are you with Jesus? No, no. When they got there, and this is where Jesus wanted to stretch them, imagine this, the disciples... And they hear something. Oh! No? And the next thing, they could see the tombs, they can see the cemetery. I mean, I don't know, some people, they are so superstitious, they wouldn't even walk through that at night. But anyway, now they're there and they see all of that. It's dry, no white beach, and there's a man come, run, uh, come, coming running to you. Ah! And you just sit in the boat. And he's, he's naked. I don't know about you. I would put it in reverse here. <laughs> Wrong destination. Jesus, you've got the wrong, not this side. Let's go back. But Jesus is deliberately taking them in that direction because he wanted to stretch them. He's taking them to a specific man for a specific reason. Other day, you know what, end of last year, I, um, I went to pick up my schools at lunch, uh, my, my children at school at lunchtime. And uh, anyway, what happens is I drive down the street, and then my neighbor, one of my neighbors, I won't reveal his identity, 
because Christ loves him. Anyway, so um, there are two safes he's, uh, for, for rifles on the street, on his driveway. And I thought maybe once he's got a garage sale, or maybe he's going to sell that. Or maybe just stop there. Maybe I can do with the bigger one for all my guns. But anyway, so I forgot about that, and then I drive past there again, and then I, rem I was reminded maybe I should ask him. So I stopped there, back. my block is still idling, and I just stopped there, and I said, he's still on so and so, the neighbor there. I said, do you sell this? He says, no, I don't sell that. But now you have to imagine what happened there. Is that there's something more. The garage doors open. There's an old car standing there, and he's busy working on that. It's 1 o'clock in the afternoon. There's a beer on the table. And, and then he starts having this conversation with me about the people that crossed his fence and that were in, over his wall, and they were doing things there, and how he's going to shoot them. He's going to kill them. What's the people going to do? Is it okay if I kill them? That's... Uh, you know, and then he's using a few, he adds flavor to that with a few other words as well. And I'm just standing there, God, I need to get out of this. Mission aborted. Let me just reverse. <laughs> I don't want to get involved in this conversation. I feel a bit uncomfortable. And as I'm preparing to end the, the kind of conversation we're having here, because I'm just trading and I'm just afraid he's going to ask me any given time, what am I doing? So I'm just trying to get out of this. Because <laughs> this is always awkward when they talk like that and then they ask you what you're doing and then they switch over to religion. But anyway, so I'm like, reverse, reverse, reverse. <laughs> get in the car, it's still idling. And then as I'm standing there, I'm sensing the Holy Spirit says to me, what if I want you to minister to him? So I'm standing there, so God, I don't think I'm ready. <laughs> I'm like, I'm so uncomfortable, Lord. This is not, this is not, I don't want to say my type, this sounds so, so it sounds if I'm better, and I'm not saying that, I'm just, I'm not comfortable. Because I've been too much in this circle and around this, and, and Jesus is taking them in that destination for a specific reason, so that they can become a little bit uncomfortable. And if we're going to be on a journey with Jesus, we better become uncomfortable with the people he's sending us to. To all those weird and unwanted people, because they were among the cemetery. You know, it represents death. Jesus is going to take us to the spiritually dead people and say, you know, become comfortable around them because this is why I'm here for you, or why I came. We don't like that place, eh? I don't like what they smell. I don't like the way they look. I don't like the way they talk. I'm not comfortable with that. But here's the thing. Christ is comfortable around them because he loves them. He can look beyond the words. He can see the heart. He can see the person that's crying out. And even though they're still in sin, even though they're at that place when they touch all different kinds of things. Christ can see you're just searching for the truth. And we are so uncomfortable, myself included this morning. I'm telling you the story because it just shows us how often we can live in this little bubble of where we, we do church. And oh, I love this. I love to spend time here with you. I love you, all of you here. But in actual fact, you know what we're supposed to do here? It's just an hour and a half. It's just testifying what God has done for us this week. Just edify one another and I say goodbye to you. I've got work this week to do. All of us. See, in the moment, our devotion, this is what happened. This guy, he was a terror unto himself, but also to others. He would hurt himself, but also others. Broken people will continue to hurt other people. That's why you need healing. That's why I need healing. Continuously. Next month, we're doing emotional, I don't want to say physical, spiritual healing course that will be presented here. So watch out our announcements for that. And I would really advise you to come and sit here and allow the Holy Spirit to minister to you. But um, Jesus is on a mission here to heal this man. And this man would run after people, chase them. Everybody is just take clear of that man. Just keep him a bit of distance because he would hurt them. But this time, when Jesus stepped on board, he came running to Jesus, not with rage, but with reverence. Because he could see there's an answer here. There's hope here. Even the demons had to acknowledge and ask permission. There's hope here. Can I propose to you that if our devotion becomes so pure and undivided, those that are dead, those that are weird, will come running to us. You've got hope. I can see it. There's something in me. Because an a undivided, pure, devoted person cannot but not talk about the love of God. I don't have to convince you this morning. When you're so devoted, I don't have to convince you to talk about Christ, to go, to share, to speak about that. Because that is who I am. That is 
how I'm so thankful, why I'm so thankful this morning for what he's done for me. And this man came to that place where he calls, uh, calls Jesus, Jesus, the Most High God. That's the word Elion. Huh? Most High God. Out of that mouth. The mouth that just almost cursed everybody else, said a lot of things, and he said something there. Jesus, the Most High God. Sometimes we'll be surprised what comes out of the mouth of people around us that are really needing Christ. They say sometimes the best words come out of the worst mouth. See, I'll share with you at a, our men's camp about three or four years ago. We had one guy there. He wasn't part of our congregation. He was just invited for the men's camp. And, and God touched him over that weekend. So through the weekend, we had a moment. And he came up to me. He said to me, Yaku, I just want to thank you. I didn't invite him. Somebody else in the congregation invited him. But I just want to thank you for organizing this camp. This is a effing nice camp. And I stood there and I thought, God, this man is just so honest and pure. Forget about the swear word. I'm not saying that's good, that's right. But I could see this man really had an experience with God. I'd rather go where that person really in search of Christ for an answer. And somewhere out of his mouth is still some of that stuff washing out. Then us, or sometimes when we're in that place where we, we know all the right words, we know how to jump high, high enough, we know what to do, we know what to say, but everything is so predictable. My life is like this. Sunday, we do a little bit of that, and next week, a little bit of that, but it continues to look like this. Now, the story didn't stop there. The man came running to Jesus. Jesus touched him, and then it became interesting. Who of you have been in town the other day when Dolphin Pharmacy burned down. Come on, raise your hand. Who, who, where did I look at that? Who went to look at that? <laughs> Keep your hand up there. I was there as well. I'm with you. <laughs> it's not sin, okay? You don't have to worry. You can raise your hand. It's not sin, <laughs> okay? It was interesting, man. I got the whole swak of Munt almost in the center of town, observing how the fire brigade is working, because we never get the opportunity to see how they actually, how it works. We only see that in the movies. <laughs> but there was, a, there was a talk of the town for a moment. It was in the newspapers. Can I just say to you, I think that was a bit, a bit different that day, a bit the level up. Can you imagine this, uh, this group of people arriving on this little boat, this one man coming out of the cemetery, Jesus meeting him. I mean, imagine the sounds and the, uh, the, all the noises, and the next thing after that you hear, 2,000 pigs screaming. I've never heard 2,000 pigs screaming. Huh? That's something to talk. I don't know how big that area is, but there must have been something that they spoke about in the air silence for a while. Sorry, with the whole <laughs> cattle. <laughs> and I'm just joking. But that's a good place to catch up on what's happening in town. But anyway. <laughs> anyway, I'm just joking. The master, did you hear about that happened? Did you hear about that guy? Did you hear what happened last week? Did you hear that guy he came here with that fellas, all of that stuff, and they came and they spoke, that, that one man that was there in the cemetery, and, and the 2,000 pigs and all of that, that's a commotion in town. There's some, here's the thing. There, in that group of people in the town, there must have been a lot of moderate people as well. And I say it with love and respect. Nothing wrong against moderate people. God has created different kinds of people. But moderate people don't like when people are too radical around them. Okay, there must be a few of you that said, should say amen, but don't say amen loud. Say it in your heart. <laughs> I find it. I mean, there's it's, it's nothing wrong with that. But sometimes we become so comfortable in our safe zone. And people shouldn't do something outside that, then they are not, mm, don't be so loud. Just calm down. And I, I can imagine those people were there as well. I mean, couldn't he just do it a bit differently? Why would he send them out in the pigs and there's all of this noise and this commotion going out in town? But here's the thing I want to make, or the, try, the point I'm trying to bring across. Often we do not have, and this is the thing, when darkness and light comes together, there's a clash, and we do not have control of the outcome. So, if I do not, and listen to this, if I'm not familiar with the outcome, I can easily reject that. Because I don't like that. I'm not familiar with it. I don't, so I judge that. And it's a warning to us sometimes that if I'm not familiar, rather to go and search for that and try to find out, rather than just speak against that. 
And I can just imagine those people. Just, what the heck is going on here? Who is this man? What's happening? Look at all the damage he brought here. All the pigs is just a mess. Well, there wasn't just an outcome. There was a response as well. Apart from the outcome. Because even at any given time when we're going to go into ministry, any time when we go on a journey, any time when we're going to go to weird people and unwanted people and dead people, there's going to be an outcome of that. There's going to be a response as well. The people turned around and they said to Jesus, can you just go? Can you just leave this place? We'd rather, 2018 version, be in the presence of the pigs. We'd rather have our pigs than we have you. We'd rather have things than we have your presence. The response wasn't as I would have predicted it to be. They didn't want Jesus there. So Jesus got in his boat and he left. So I sense to say to many of you here this morning, you've been out there, you've been on the journey, all keen, maybe it happened early in your journey with Christ, and then it took you to those weird people, and you didn't, you didn't get the response you anticipated. You didn't get the outcome as you anticipated. And Christ is inviting you back into that boat. He said, it's okay. That'll happen. It will happen. Can I say to you this morning, even this morning it happened as well, and I haven't seen it for other services, that people sometimes just walk out, out of the presence. Do you know how intimidating sometimes it can be when you know that they've just been confronted with the light and they just choose to walk out of that? Here's the thing, I have to look past that. You're going to, and I'm going to be carriers of light. And sometimes when light meets darkness, people can either decide to change, and I say that with love as well. We have to learn how to do that, to bring it across, and make sure that our contribution, our side, we are clean, that we've done our best to the best of our ability. But even if we've done that, the outcome can sometimes not be as we anticipated it to be. But we cannot be thrown by that. We have to move past that place. And the man comes to Jesus, and this man says to Jesus, Jesus, can I, can I follow you? And Jesus says, no, sorry, go back and tell the others. And some translations translate it, that this man went and he told ten other towns about what Jesus has done for him. One man. The result of one healing. The result of some people that were willing to move from the tree into the boat, through the storm, through a dark night, outside the comfort zone, with Jesus, to a place that they didn't know, to, a pe to people that they're not comfortable with, uh, with, but just willing to walk with Jesus. He touches this man in ten cities or ten towns has, affected, has been affected as a result of that. In my own life, I've, shared, uh, I've experienced that some years ago when we went to England and um, my youngest brother was there already and what happened to be is, is as we were preparing to go across there oops what happened is my, um, he spoke to my dad and he said to my dad can you ask Jaco to bring me a bottle of brandy with him and he was living in the world, fully going out there, having a go. And I responded, I said, I'm not taking a brandy with, or bottle of brandy with me. I'll bring you a Bible, <laughs> jokingly. So long story short, as we got there, he was in his own world, trying to find pleasure there, and all kinds of things. And then what happens is we were building a relationship, strengthening that, because we believed, or I believed, that God has placed me there for a reason as well. Many other things, but um, so I kept on inviting him, and he didn't want to go. He's got his own world. You know, if you've ever been in, in a place like that, you know, I mean, we live in a moderate place. I know there are horrible things happening right in our midst sometimes. If you look at what's happening with, with the children at school, if you look at what's happening in families, there's so much pain in our own world. But even back there, there was just, you know, going out at night. I remember you would go into clubs, and when, uh, when you would drive past that, getting back to the club thing now, but you would drive past that club, and you think, God, if you would just look on this, down on this, I don't know what it seems or looks like to you, but horrible things, you stories that you hear about drugs and stuff that people were doing in there. So my brother, he was going to clubs and all of that stuff, and he, was, he can tell his own testimony, but using drugs and all kinds of things. And um, 
So we're building our relationship and keep on inviting. So one day, I continued inviting him. And he said, uh, you know, I'll go to church, but um, why don't you ever go with me to a club? You always want me to go to your church. You want me to take, uh, take me with you. You never want to go with me. I said, well, and I saw my opportunity. I said, oh, I'll go with you. Now let's make a deal. Tonight, I'll go with you to the club. But then tomorrow morning, you come with me to church. Deal. Fine. And what happens, I went there with him. And I'm not saying to everybody here this morning, go out to the club this week, please. Make sure that the Holy Spirit tells you that. Because we are on a mission here. And I tell you, I wasn't, surely wasn't comfortable there. But I was there on a mission with Christ, on a journey, taking me to unwanted people in a cemetery, <laughs> spiritually speaking. And I said to him beforehand, I said, listen, I'll go with you. I'll enjoy this with you, but I'll enjoy it with my drinks. I don't need the other drink to take me to that place of enjoying myself. So anyway, we were there the right now, the night, enjoyed it. I enjoyed it there with my brother. Because God, I'm just trusting for this. And the next morning, I woke him up. He was still asleep, you know. And uh, what's a Africa, hangover? That's a word, yeah, I was looking for. Somebody's following my thoughts. Thank you so much. You're listening attentively. Because I was about to say, what is the Bible last? And you said a hangover. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. I was, it was on my tip of my tongue to ask. And then I heard it in the voice. Thank you, God, for spirit-inspired people that's sitting here in the audience. So I woke him up the next morning. He still got a hangover. But fortunately, by God's grace, I got him out of the bed and we're off to church. And that day, God saved him with the hangover. With the hangover, that's part of his destiny. Can I share to you, today's in ministry. Today he's in Botswana, today he's successfully preaching to hundreds, even a church bigger than ours. The result of one invitation, the result of one man that was touched 10 times. You don't know you underestimate sometimes the power of one invitation, of one healing, of one person that can be touched. And it's, a, it's not about the thousands, it's about that one person that we can touch this year. If each one of us, imagine what God can do with it. He can multiply. Let us not try multiply. <laughs> We're supposed to multiply, but it's amazing what God can do with it. One, if we can settle to that. I mean, let's close our eyes. You know, I think about that group of people while your eyes are still closing, and I'm thinking about those people that sat there. And if I could go back in time, I would ask those that sat under the tree, so, how was your day? Are you just going to sit there? Are you willing to journey with Christ? Because I'm sure what the disciples shared after that day with the rest that stayed behind us, you didn't know, or you don't know what you've missed. Oh, I don't May Christ take you on a journey this morning as, we, as every eye is closed. I want to ask you this morning, before we journey, before we talk about the journey, we're going to do some practical stuff this morning and pray. I need to make sure or give you the opportunity that you are at that place that you are ready with Him in a relationship. Maybe you sit here and, and I'm asking you and I'm talking about journeying to a different place and to different people. But first of all, before you journey, Christ wants to take your hand and say, you are special, you are mine. But He can only do that when you come to Him and admit that you need Him, that you admit that you are a sinner, that you admit that He's your highest hope, your only hope this morning.